How's everybody doing? Good. It is good to be with you. I'm excited to share with you. I look out, I see uh, just so many different faces, and I love it. I love that I'm a part of a church that has diversity. Um, Whether you're aware of it or not, we have families from Liberia, from uh, Kenya, from Burundi, uh, from Ghana, from Mexico, from Peru, Congo, Haiti. We even have people all the way from Texas. And I love it. And I love the fact that despite our differences, despite our different backgrounds, despite um, our different cultures that we've brought up, we can all gather under one roof for the same sole purpose of worshiping Jesus Christ. And I love that Sunday should be the most diverse day of the week. And uh, what I love too is when you look to your left or to your right, that you don't have to look like the person to the left or the right of you because God made you you. And we're all different. We all have different qualities and giftings. And uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that we get to see a little small glimpse of what heaven is going to be like when every tribe, every nation, every tongue is worshiping, singing alleluia. Glory, glory, glory to God in the highest forever and ever. And so my prayer is that this church would just continue to grow and uh, continue to reach out and uh, embrace all of our differences that we can come together under the unity of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Amen. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. We are continuing in our series, Red Letters. And the Red Letters, if you have a red-lettered edition Bible, what that simply means is that those are the words of Jesus Christ. So whenever you see your red letters um, or red words in the scriptures, that's Jesus speaking. And today we're looking at a portion of scripture where Jesus identifies himself as being the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And this is very significant because in the Old Testament, the vine was a common symbol for the nation of Israel, which were God's chosen people. And most remarkable is the fact that whenever historic Israel is referred to under this figure as being the vine, it is the vine's failure to produce good fruit that is emphasized along with the corresponding threat of God's judgment on a nation. Isaiah chapter 5 is a mirroring passage that Jesus is referring to in our text in John 15. And we won't look at these scriptures, but on the screen are multiple uh, points of reference where, of where Israel was referred to as the vine. And in the text we're about to read, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his followers. He is speaking to people that believe um, in, in God, who are religious, and they have an understanding that the vine was really... Israel. And so Jesus is correcting the thought that salvation comes from being a part of God's chosen people. The Jews were all about lineage and bloodline and heritage, and they viewed Israel as the source of their salvation. They were proud to be born into the Jewish faith, but for many of them, their faith was in their lineage and not in their God. And I want to ask you this morning are you a Christian because your parents are Christians? Are you a Christian because that's the way you were raised and that's your family's lineage? Is it your grandparents? Are you a Christian because you've attached yourself to the true vine? Not through your lineage, not through your bloodline, not coattailing in on someone else's faith, but you have attached yourself to Jesus Christ, the true vine, our salvation, our hope, our strength, our source of life. Let's read from our text, John chapter 15 starting in verse chapter 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. 
If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and I remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. I want to just pause there and remind you, Jesus Christ has chosen you. God has chosen you. And it's out of our response to him pursuing us, that we attach ourselves to Christ. It doesn't say I chose you when you were good enough. It doesn't say that I chose you when you earned my love. It doesn't say I chose you when this conditional thing happened. It says that he chose us. Picking up, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning We ask for your strength. We ask that your word would come alive to us. I pray that ears would be opened. People that have never heard your voice, never felt that nudge of the Holy Spirit, that their spirit would be awakened this morning, that we would be alert. God, I pray that you would give us the ability to hear and the ability to carry out what you're calling us to, Lord. We look to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we have Jesus say, I am the vine, my Father is the gardener. Connect yourself to me and live, bear fruit. And if you don't, my Father will cut you off and throw you into the fire. Now those are some pretty harsh words of Jesus. It's an incredibly bold claim. Jesus is correcting their way of thinking. No longer are you attached by lineage. You never were. I am the vine. I am your source of bearing fruit and salvation. If you don't hear anything else from the rest of my message, and please listen to this right now, that Jesus Christ is the source of life and salvation. Through him is the only way to heaven. Through him we find our salvation. Through Jesus we are able to do the good works that God has laid out before us to accomplish. And only in Christ will we be able to do those things. Apart from him we cannot produce fruit. Apart from him, we produce fake fruit. Apart from him, we become exhausted and burnt out. If you are here this morning, and you are tired, and you are burnt out, and you feel like Christianity is just too much for you, then I just simply present this. Maybe you're not fully connected to the vine. Because when we are fully connected to the source of life, when we are fully connected to the vine, Christianity is not taxing He begins to change our hearts. He begins to change the way that we think. And now we're not just trying to abide by a list of rules. Our heart has been, has received a heart transplant. It has been changed. We do because we we want to do because God has changed us. It's a supernatural act when we abide in Christ. Now think with me, what, what could this church look like if we were all fully connected to the vine, fully producing fruit, What would our marriages, our families, our schools, our workplace look like? I know in my life it's a daily struggle to remain connected to the vine. It is so easy for me to get up and and me feel like I've just got so much to do and I've got so many places to be and I've got all these things that I want to accomplish and I just hit the floor running. And, And I fail to just simply ask God to come into my life and to attach, and to be with God before I do things for God. It's a daily temptation. Verse 4, Jesus says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. And it seems like such a simple task. Remain in him. Attach yourself to him. Abide in him. But 
But how many know that sometimes we like to overcomplicate the most simple tasks in life, right? The first thing that you need to remember is that the gardener is the one who seals our bond with Christ. Simply ask the Father to seal your love for Christ. Ask the Father to help you obey his commands. Ask the Father to help you love Jesus with everything. Ask the Father to take away your desires of your flesh and and give you a new heart and give you new desires. Ask the Spirit of God to help you in this. Apart from it, we can do nothing. It's as simple as that. Every morning, wake up and say, God, I need your help. The Bible says that no man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him in. You know what that means? That means you can't love God without him first loving you. That means you can't love God without him drawing you in. And so what we do in humility is we say, God, come, help me. Help me, Lord, because apart from you, I can't even love you. Give me faith. Give me faith to believe. Give me faith to see. I need your help. Apart from him, we cannot do anything. It's as simple as just asking a faithful father to seal your love for Christ. But as you ask, remember that faith is a partnership. As God grants us the ability to believe, as God helps us love Jesus, as he changes our desires, it then becomes our responsibility to respond in obedience to his commands. This text says, those who obey are my friends. A practical way to remain in Christ is to get into the word of God first thing in the morning. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the first words of this book, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. When you spend time in the scriptures, you are spending time with Jesus Christ, who is the word. He came to earth, he dwelt among man, he took on flesh, and he was the perfect demonstration of God's word. In the morning, and, 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 and when you start your morning in the word of God we can't skip step one you need help ask God for help ask him to give you the ability to read the word and understand ask God to help you to see Christ in the scriptures ask God as simple as this God place in me the hunger and the thirst to desire the word of God because if you're anything like me I don't just naturally crave the word of God I naturally crave Netflix or something that's easy or mindless. I need God to give me the desire to get in his word. And it's not a lack of faith to ask God for that. Simply ask him, say, God, I want to be in your word. I know I need to be in your word. So give me the desire to be in your word. And when I read your word, let it come alive by your spirit so that I might see Christ. Psalm chapter 1 says this so beautifully. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Day and night. When we do that, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I'd encourage you not just to read in the morning, but to read at night as well. Sometimes I feel like, oh, yay me, I I didn't miss devotions this week. And then I read Psalm 1, I'm like, day and night? (laughs) Anybody else? Like, oh, me? (laughs) When we go to God in the morning, it shows your humility and your acknowledgement that you need God and that apart from him you can do nothing. It shows God him honor in the sense that you are giving God the first fruits of your time. You are honoring him with your first intellectual movements of the day. It's an opportunity to suit up in the armor of God. What if we started going into our workplaces uh, where we've already spent time putting on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the belts of truth and carrying the sword of the spirit instead of just coming to him at the end of the day where we've walked through the battlefield and we're saying, God, heal me, forgive me, cleanse me because this today was a mess. We've got authority of today, but it starts in the presence of God. 
But then as we, we re-enter into God's word at night, spend time in prayer, and it's an opportunity for you to thank God for the blessings throughout your day. It's an opportunity for you to repent of the sins and your shortcomings of that day. It's an opportunity for you to praise God for his faithfulness. And that constant connection to Jesus through the word will no doubt produce fruit. Verse 3 of Psalm 1 is where I want to live. I want to be like a tree planted by the streams of living water that produces fruit in its season, that its leaves never wither, and whatever he does prospers. That's where I want to live. I want to be a tree that provides shade for those who are weary. I want to be a tree that produces fruit that those that are exhausted and, and, and need life. And it starts with remaining in Christ through the word of God and asking God to help us. As we respond to the faith that God places in our hearts, our heavenly father or the gardener will seal our connection to his son, Jesus, and fruit will take place. Do we have any gardeners in the house? Anybody that likes to garden? Raise your hand high, no shame, right? As far as me, you don't want me to touch it. Not a good idea. I will reap the benefit of someone else's hard work I'll go to Hy-Vee and buy some fruit or vegetables, but I'm, I ain't growing it, right? I'm not, not me. But how many of you gardeners or people are familiar with grafting? Anybody? Paul uses this language a little bit in the book of Romans where he talks about the Gentiles being grafted into the family of God. A Gentile is you and me. It's someone who is not born into the lineage of God. It's not born into the Jewish faith. It's it's important to remember in our text that Jesus has just given this new framework of thinking that the vine is not Israel. It's him. And so Paul picks up on Jesus' words and he realizes that now because the vine is not in lineage, The vine is not in heritage. The vine is not in bloodline. The vine is in Jesus. That means anybody can be attached to Jesus. And the Jews missed that in the Old Testament. They were supposed to be an evangelistic nation. They were supposed to to reach out, and they just completely missed it. And they they took their God, and they hoarded him for himself. And, 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 And Paul gets in on this grafting and says, Gentiles can be grafted into the family of God. Now, grafting is a technique that's been around for a very long time. There are records of the Chinese using it as early as 2000 BC. And in Leviticus chapter 19, many believe that it talks about grafting, which was written in about 1400 BC. Grafting or graftage is a horticulture technique where tissues of plants are joined together to continue their growth together. And the upper part of the combined plant is called the scion. Everybody say scion. While the lower part is called the rootstock. Everybody say rootstock. Now, the scion carries the genes of what fruit is going to be produced. The rootstock carries the nutrients and provides the life to the scion. So up, up on the screen you'll see a picture And one way to graft is you cut the rootstock and then you cut the scion and you bind them together and you bind them with a cord and you cover them in some type of hot tar or wax. And the goal is to get what they call a vascular connection. Say vascular connection. Very good. The success of joining, of this joining requires that the vascular tissue grow together and such joining is called inosculation. Now nutrients are flowing from the rootstock into the scion and without this vascular connection the branch will not grow. This picture here is what it might look like um, and this, this graft took place two years prior to this and you can see where they have sealed the rootstock and the, the scion or the branch with some hot tar and wax and you can see how it's kind of cut off at the top. The reason why they seal that is to get that vascular connection so the nutrients and the tissues can grow together and then inosculation takes place. They seal the top of the rootstock so that the nutrients doesn't just escape, that it's forced into the scion. The next picture is the same tree two years later. 
That's amazing that they can do that. There's another picture of a graft, some type of plant. I don't know what it is. There's budding. There's all different types of it. But this is, is a picture that, uh, um, of, of a ch- cherry, uh, excuse me, a, a cherry blossom tree where they put in a strand of pink into a normal thing. And so it's amazing that as you graft, you can actually produce a fruit-bearing branch. It's absolutely amazing. I had this thought, and maybe you're thinking the same thing too, like, okay, if I were to plant an apple tree in my backyard and I want to graft in an orange branch, can you do that and have like an apple orange tree in your backyard? So I looked that up, and this is what I found, that apple trees and orange trees, while both fruit trees, do not come from the same plant families. Apple trees are members of the Rosacea, or the rose family, while orange trees are part of the Rudacea family, or the root, or the citrus family. So grafting a branch from one tree to another requires that they be closely related so that the bark and the sapwood can grow together successfully. Thus, apples and oranges are not compatible for grafting. But get this. The Bible says that man was created in the image of God. You and I, we all, even though we're different, even though we look different, We were created in the image of God. And that means we are closely related, which allows us to be grafted into Jesus, who is the vine or the rootstock. It's God our Father, the gardener, who seals our connection and thus creates a vascular connection where now Christ's life-giving blood is flowing in us and through us, and because we have this connection, we bear fruit. And here's the really cool part. If you remember earlier, I informed you that the scion is the part that determines what type of fruit it will bear. We are all closely related because we are made in God's image, yet we have the subtle differences in personalities and giftings. Therefore, our fruit is going to look differently from individual to individual. Sam Van Aken is a professor at Syracuse University, and he spent over nine years grafting together this tree. This tree is called the tree of 40 fruit because it has 40 different fruits on it, including peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, and almonds. And he now has planted and grafted several of these trees all across the nation. Jesus wants you to attach yourself to him, to have the Father seal your connection to him that you might bear fruit. It might be painful and uncomfortable at first, but once that true vascular connection takes place and you tap into the source of life, you become a part of the most beautiful tree in the world. The church of God. Hear me. Stop comparing your fruit to the person to your left and to your right. You are not meant to look like them. You each have unique giftings and unique callings on your life. Pastor Brian might be a plum. My wife might be a peach. I might be a nectarine. My dad is some kind of nut. We're different. (laughs) You guys are laughing because it's true. (laughs) We are all different. And as we remain in him, the fruit will take place. It may not look the way that we want it to look, and it might not blossom as quickly as we want it to blossom. But let there be no confusion that as we remain in Christ, we will bear fruit. Verse 5, Jesus says, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me ask you this morning, do you bear fruit? Are you a fruit-bearing Christian? And if you do, do you bear much fruit? Or is it sporadic? This isn't in my notes, but I feel led to say it, that part of remaining in Christ is remaining in the fellowship of Christ. And, and I think sometimes it becomes very difficult to live out our faith and stay connected to Christ when we're constantly being around people that are trying to pull us off the branch, off the rootstock. 
where when we gather together on Sundays and Wednesdays, in shared interest groups, small groups, Sunday school classes, we're all rooting and, and trying to achieve the same thing. A good question to ask is not just, are you producing fruit, but, but why do we produce fruit? Why does God want to flow through us? Why does God want you to bear not just fruit, but much fruit? And I believe we find that answer when we jump to verse 8 where Jesus says this. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. The purpose of all fruit is to bring God glory. When God gives you joy, it's so that others might see him in you. When God gives you an inner peace in the midst of your storm, it's so that God might see other it's so that others might see God in you. When you help someone in need, it's so that others might see God in you. When we see a prayer that is answered in Jesus' name, it's so that others might see God and give him glory. You you see what I'm saying? The purpose of your fruit is to bring glory to God, our Father. Everything and anything that we accomplish is really Christ's work accomplished through us. When Jesus says, even greater things than these you will do to his disciples, he's not saying that, Austin, you're going to you're going to heal and you're going to do this. No, he's saying it was me that was doing the miracles while I'm on earth and now that I sit at the right hand of God our Father as your intercessor, it's still me doing the miracles. And I'm just going to choose to flow through you in an even greater way. It was Jesus performing miracles back then in our lives and it's Jesus performing miracles now in our lives. Everything that you have of who you are The beautiful qualities of who you are is a result of Jesus Christ. Because honestly, in my heart and in my flesh, I'm selfish. I don't want to give. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to sacrifice. There's times where I don't want to be kind or gentle. There's times where I can be pretty pessimistic sometimes. But that's in my flesh. And so the times when I'm positive and optimistic, and I'm joyful, and I'm loving, and I'm grateful, and and I'm giving, and I'm forgiving, that is Christ in me. And I don't get glory for that, because that's not in my nature. It's in God's nature. So let's attach ourselves to the rootstock, so that we can produce the fruit that God wants us to produce. God, may there be less of me and more of you. Rid me of my insecurity so that I might live for the only job well done that even matters. And may that prayer not just be my prayer, but our church's prayer. I don't want new hope to have a great reputation. I want my God to have a great reputation. Help us, Lord, give you the proper glory that you deserve. Help us. And in verse 6, Jesus gives the same foretelling that is shared in Isaiah chapter 5. The New Testament doesn't contradict the Old Testament. It confirms it. Jesus says in verse 6, If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. This is a sobering thought. I don't believe that scaring someone into a relationship with God is the most effective way of reaching your friends. But I also want all of my friends to know the full truth. Scripture is clear that those not found in Christ will be punished. There are eternal consequences and eternal rewards at stake. You're either attached or you're not. You're either with Christ or you're not. I don't want anyone to end up in hell and say, Pastor, how come you never told me? How come you never told me of the seriousness of this nature? How come you never warned me? If you've never made the commitment to attach yourself to Christ, today is the day. 
God wants you to be in a relationship with him. He chose you. And because of that, he will help you do that, but we must remain in him. Simply ask the Father to place a love in your heart for him. Musicians, would you come? In just a moment, I'm going to invite people to come forward to the altar to worship, to pray. Maybe, maybe you just have been sitting here this entire sermon and you're just like, man, I, just, I don't feel connected to God. I, I know that I've lived a detached life. I was connected to him. There was a season that I was, but I don't know what happened. I, just, I guess I've just slowly disconnected. The altar is nothing magical. It's, you can encounter God in your, your seat, but I think sometimes there's just something that works when we outwardly express what's going on the inside of our hearts. And just coming forward and saying, God, I come to the altar, I kneel down in a position of humility, saying, God, I need you. Every hour, God, I need you. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? We do that not so that we can be some weird cult or something like that. We do that just simply to eliminate distractions. We're going to take the next five or six minutes and worship and prayer. If you need to be prayed for healing, you know, come forward. Let's, let's pray. Let's believe God to do something. Just eliminate distractions around you. What is the Spirit of God speaking to you? If you're here this morning and you feel like God is speaking to your heart that you need to be connected to Jesus Christ, the, the true vine, now is the time to do that. Some of you know that you've been living detached from the infinite source of strength and life. And if that's you and you'd say, Pastor, I need to reattach myself to Jesus Christ, would you just simply look up and make eye contact with me? Maybe raise a hand a little bit. I'm looking out to my right. Is there anyone here that would say, I need to reattach myself to Jesus Christ and I need God's help in that moment? Yes. Yeah, so many. Yes. I'm kind of in the middle. Yes. Yes. God, attach us, Lord. Give us faith. Now my left... Yes. God, you see every heart. You see every desire, Lord. Birth in us a desire. Continue with your eyes closed and head bowed. I always want to give the opportunity for someone who has never made Jesus the Lord of their life. Never ask him to forgive you of your sins, your shortcomings. You've never repented and turned and said, God, I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to heal me. I need you to forgive me. And if that's you, just with every eye closed and head bowed out of respect for your neighbor, would you just raise your hand and look up at me? Is there anyone here for the first time that'd say, yes. And say, Jesus, come into my life. Save me. I want to remain in you. For those that raise their hand, would you just repeat this prayer after me? God, save me. Forgive me of my sin, God. Attach me to your son, Jesus Christ. Change my heart. I'm sorry, Lord, for what I've done. I'm sorry that I've sinned against you and sinned against others. I need your help. I can't do this on my own. I invite you into my life. I invite you into my way of thinking. I invite you into every decision that I make. I make you Lord of my life. Forgive me, heal me, and save me. I trust in you, Jesus. I believe that you are the one true king. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's not be in a hurry in this moment. Let's give God just another couple, three minutes.
as the band just softly plays, can we as a church body really pray? We say that we desire more. We say that we want more. We say that we want to be connected. Let's give God some time to move this morning. Just right where you are, just close your eyes, tune things out, and just begin to have a conversation with the Lord. Some of you just need to be still and listen to what God has to say. Others of you just need to pray, so let's just, let's just press in just for the next couple minutes. Just as a church family, let's not be afraid of this. This is when God speaks. This is when God speaks. Jesus, speak to us, Lord. God, may that be the prayer of our hearts. May we not live in the deception that apart from you we can do these things, but may we live rooted in you, the true vine, the source of all strength and salvation, Jesus Christ, you are. Amen.